ranking member of the University of San Agustin here in Ilino City, and I am your English major coach. I am a graduate of a bachelor's degree in secondary education major in English from West Visayas State University, and I have a master's degree in English as a second language from the University of the Philippines. Let's start. Question number one. We use the blank when we talk about changes happening now or around now. A, simple present tense. The form is I, I do something. B, present progressive tense or present continuous tense. The form is I am doing something. C, simple past tense. The form is I did something. And letter D, present perfect tense. The form is I have done something. Again, we use the blank when we talk about changes happening now or around now. A, simple present tense. B, present progressive tense. Or present continuous tense. Letter C, simple past tense. D, present perfect tense. Okay, the correct answer is letter B, present progressive tense. We use the present progressive tense when we talk about changes happening now or around now. Again, the form of letter A, simple present tense, is I do something. Present progressive tense is I am doing something. Simple past tense is I did something. And present perfect tense is I have done something. The correct answer is present progressive tense. When we talk about changes happening now or around now, well, in the Philippines, again, in the Philippines, we usually term it as present progressive. But in British English, it is present continuous. Present progressive. Present continuous. Examples, the population of the world is rising very fast. We don't say the population of the world rises fast. No? Changes around now, development around now is rising fast. Is your English getting better? We don't say, does your English get better? Changes, development happening around now. Question number two, which of the following is used to describe objective reflection on the nature of language? Again, which of the following is used to describe objective reflection on the nature of language? A, psycholinguistic awareness. B, metalinguistic reasoning. C, morphological pragmatics. D, linguistic Relativity. Again, which of the following is used to describe objective reflection on the nature of language? A, psycholinguistic awareness. B, metalinguistic reasoning. C, morphological pragmatics. D, linguistic relativity. The correct answer is letter B, metalinguistic reasoning. Metalinguistic reasoning. When you say Meta, it means self-awareness, awareness of oneself, awareness of itself. There is reflection involved here. It says, used to describe objective reflection on the nature of language. So there is reflection involved here. That is why in educational psychology, we have the concepts of metacognition. We have the concept, rather, of metacognition, which is thinking about thinking. You know, we reflect on the process of thinking, metacognition. In metalinguistic reasoning, 
we reflect on the nature of language. What is language? Why do we use language? And in the process, we organize and we systematize language. Well, we use the term metalinguistic reasoning for practices of organizing and systematizing the language used to speak about objects, properties, and relationships. Next, number three. In Greek mythology, who slew the Minotaur? Again, in Greek mythology, who slew the Minotaur? A. Heracles. B. Minos. C. Persius. D. Tissues. Again, in Greek mythology, who slew the Minotaur? A. Heracles. B. Minos. C. Persius. D. Tissues. The correct answer is letter D. Tissues. Tissues. The Minotaur is also called, is also known as the bull of Minos, no? the bull of King Minos. It was the offspring of Pasiphae, the wife of King Minos. It was sent to Minos by the god Poseidon for sacrifice. But Minos, instead of sacrificing it, he kept it alive. The Minotaur. So here's the Minotaur. In Greek mythology, uh, it is a fabulous monster of Crete that had the body of a man and the head of a bull. Minotaur. So here you can see Tissues or Tissues killing the Minotaur. Tissues was a great hero of Attic legend. He had a lot of adventures, which included his killing of the Minotaur. Number four. Hutchinson and Waters are experts in A, English for specific purposes, that's ESP. B, literary criticism. C, second language acquisition. D, creative writing. Again, Hutchinson and Waters are experts in A, English for specific purposes or ESP. B, literary criticism. C, second language acquisition or SLA. And letter D, creative writing. Okay, the correct answer is letter A, English for specific purposes. Hutchinson and Waters are experts in English for specific purposes. So here is Tom Hutchinson and Alan Waters. They are experts in ESP. Tom Hutchinson, Professor Hutchinson is a professor at the Institute for English Language Education at Lancaster University, a famous university in the United Kingdom. On the other hand, Professor Waters is also, well, also a professor at Lancaster University in its Department of Linguistics and English Language. Their famous book, well, they have a famous book, is entitled English for Specific Purposes, a Learning-Centered Approach. It was published in 1987 by the Cambridge University Press. Professor Hutchinson and Professor Waters became famous because of their book entitled English for Specific Purposes, a Learning-Centered Approach, published in 1987 by the Cambridge University Press. Okay, next, number five. Question number five. 
ESP or English for specific purposes is A, teacher-centered, B, learner-centered, C, both A and B, both teacher-centered and learner-centered. And letter D, neither A nor B. Not teacher-centered, not learner-centered. Okay, what is the correct answer? The correct answer is ESP is learner-centered. ESP is learned. This is a very important concept that you need to understand that ESP or English for specific purposes is learner centered or student centered. Why is ESP learner centered? Because its aim is to fulfill the needs and interests of the learners. That's the main aim. That's the end all and be all of ESP. To fulfill the needs and interests of the learners. That is why the process of needs assessment is central in ESP. It, 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 is, a, it is a very important process in ESP, needs assessment. ESP, or English for Specific Purposes, is a learner-centered approach to teaching English as an additional language, which focuses on developing communicative competence in a specific discipline, such as academics, accounting, agrology, business, IT, or information technology, teaching, and engineering. Being learner-centered, ESP provides opportunities for learners to practice critical and creative thinking, solving problems, and making decisions. Next, number six. Which of the following is the best definition of remedial English? A. Instruction intended to correct bad habits in English. B. Instruction intended to bring students up to the level they are supposed to have reached in order to carry out language tasks. C. Any type of language instruction that makes students learn. B. All of these. E. None of these. Again, which of the following is the best Definition of remedial English. A, instruction intended to correct bad habits in English. B, instruction intended to bring students up to the level they are supposed to have reached in order to carry out language tasks. C, any type of language instruction that makes students learn. B, all of these. E, none of these. The correct answer is letter B, instruction intended to bring students up to the level they are supposed to have reached in order to carry out language tasks from so letter B. When you say remedial, we're talking here of remedial English, when you say remedial, it refers to an activity that is intended to correct or improve something, especially skills. Well, actually, if you think about it, letter A is also correct. Instruction intended to correct bad habits in English, but the question is the best definition. We are looking for the best definition of remedial English. In remedial English, the goal here is, well, to make things better. All of the choices here are good definitions of remedial English. But we are looking for the best definition. So I think, and I believe, that the correct answer is B. Remedial English is the instruction intended to bring students up to the level they are supposed to have reached in order to carry out language tests. Let's see what, what the experts have to say about this. According to what, well, according to Professor Arthur King of Brigham Young University in Utah, by remedial English, 
I do mean instruction intended to correct bad habits. But above all, I mean instruction intended to bring students up to the level they are supposed to have reached in order to carry out requisite tasks of understanding the spoken and written word of speaking and of writing. The suppositions are not always explicit, but they are nearly always disappointed. That is according to an expert, no? Professor Arthur King of Brigham Young University based in, well, located in Utah in the United States. So Professor King's definition of remedial English focuses on the concept of remedial English helping students reach their full potential. So this is the best definition of remedial English. Number seven, psycholinguists generally consider that there are three stages in language production. Which of the following best describes them in the correct order? Again, psycholinguists generally consider that there are three stages in language production. Which of the following best describes them in the correct order? A, grammatical encoding, conceptualization, and phonological or orthographic encoding. B, conceptualization, morphological encoding, and grammatical encoding. C, conceptualization, grammatical encoding, and phonological or orthographic encoding. And Larry D, phonological bootstrapping, grammatical encoding, and orthographic encoding. So, psycholinguists generally consider that there are three stages in language production. So, which of the following best describes them in the correct order? The correct answer is letter C. First, we have conceptualization, followed by grammatical encoding, and followed by either phonological encoding or ethnographic encoding. So letter C. Let's discuss them. Um, let's discuss this concept thoroughly. Well, psycholinguists generally consider who, who are they? What, what do psycholinguists study? Of course, psycholinguists are social scientists who study psycholinguistics, which connects psychology and linguistics. So psycholinguistics is a marriage between psychology and linguistics. Psycholinguistics is concerned with the cognitive, it means in the mind or in the brain, the cognitive faculties and processes that are necessary to produce the grammatical constructions of language. Again, Psycholinguistics is concerned with the cognitive faculties and processes that are necessary to produce the grammatical constructions of language. According to Philip Banyard et al. in their book, Essential Psychology, there are three stages in language production, and they are, letter C, conceptualization, grammatical encoding, and phonological or orthographic encoding. Of course, other experts have different opinions. Some say there are four stages, but let's stick to what Professor Banyard and friends give us in the book, Essential Psychology. There are three, conceptualization, grammatical encoding, and phonological or orthographic encoding. Let's discuss them one by one. First, what is language production? Language production refers to the process involved in creating and expressing meaning through language. The first stage, according to Professor 
Danyard and all is conceptualization. This is the first step in language production. It means how to conceptualize the speech in our mind. We start thinking of ideas, concepts, thoughts. That is the first step in language production. You conceptualize. This is followed by the process of grammatical encoding. It has the task of selecting and retrieving the syntactic and lexical forms that can convey non-linguistic thoughts and then determining the morphological forms and their constituent ordering in preparation for their phonological spell out and eventual externalization. This is grammatical encoding. So first we start to think of ideas, concepts, thoughts, then followed by grammatical encoding, which is we find and use correct grammar, correct grammar forms and structures for your, you know, for our concepts and thoughts and ideas. That is grammatical encoding. And followed by, this is followed by either phonological encoding or orthographic encoding. When you say phonological encoding, it is the production of sounds used in spoken language. This is if the kind of language that we have is a spoken one, right? Oral communication. If it is written, then we undergo what we call orthographic encoding refers to methods and rules by which a language is written. Orthographic encoding. This includes the rules for spelling, syntax, punctuation, etc. that are agreed upon to make a written language a vehicle for clear and precise communication. That is orthographic encoding. For written language, for spoken language, it's phonological encoding. Orthography is a set of conventions for writing a language, including norms of spelling, hyphenation, capitalization, word breaks, etc. Next, number eight. Phrasal verbs are composed of ordinary verbs and A, particles. B, content words. C, special verbs. D, loan words. Again, phrasal verbs are composed of ordinary verbs and A, particles. B, content words. C, special verbs. D, loan words. The correct answer is particles. So, phrasal verbs are composed of ordinary verbs plus particles. Specifically, prepositions. When you say particles, these are words that into the main parts of speech. For example, the word the, the word and, the word for. These are particles. In the phrasal verbs, the particles are usually prepositions. So verbs plus prepositions. For example, stand up. Your ordinary verb is stand and your particle is up. It is actually a preposition, stand up. Phrasal verbs make your language informal. So in formal English, that is written English, we do not encourage you to use phrasal verbs because it will give your Document, for example, an informal tone. So phrasal verbs are basically used in spoken English, not in written English. So it makes phrasal verbs make your language informal, and it is usually used in spoken English. Phrasal verbs are very common in English, especially in more. Informal contexts. 
phrasal verbs are phrases that indicate actions. They are generally used in spoken English. Example, look for, which means to search. Now let's, yes, let's go to number nine. Remedial language classes enable the child to, to gain a positive impact, B, negative impact, C, both A and B, but both positive impact and ne negative impact, and letter D, neither A nor B. Again, remedial language classes enable the child to A, gain positive impact, B, negative impact, C, both A and B, B, neither A nor B. The correct answer is letter A, positive impact. Remedial language classes enable the child to gain positive impact. De definitely, remedial classes have a positive impact especially on struggling students. Remedial education has thus proved that it has short and long-term benefits for children. These benefits can be seen in the cognitive and emotional domains, and this promotes future success. Research has shown that remedial schools allow children to feel comfortable within their learning environments. This leads to much greater confidence levels. Strategies are taught to these children to help them understand and comprehend various topics such as emotional coping. So remedial language classes enable the child to gain positive impact. Number 10, in ESP or English for specific purposes, it is a set of integrated courses leading to a broader understanding of a subject area. A, session. B, syllabus. C, curriculum. D, program. Again, in ESP or English for specific purposes. It is a set of integrated courses leading to a broader understanding of the subject area. A, session. B, syllabus. C, curriculum. B, program. The correct answer is program. For example, a student who hopes to study economics in the future would take an ESP class entitled English for Economics because this will help him or her survive college and eventually professional life. A future psychology student would choose the, ES, the ESP class English for Psychology. One very popular ESP program is Business English. English for specific purposes or ESP programs are designed to, for students who want to improve their English in a certain professional field of study normally taught at the university. Different from pre-academic and university ESL programs, which teach basic academic skills for all fields of study, ESP programs teach the English needed in specific academic subjects, such as in economics or psychology. So we have economics English, we have psycho medical English, we have legal English, we have scientific English. Number 11, a garden path sentence can be described as A, a sentence with a structure that leads to initial misinterpretation and subsequent reanalysis. Letter B, letter B, a sentence that is ambiguously worded so as to elicit an understanding of the reader's psychological 
characteristic C, a sentence that is structured so that the reader, having only read the beginning, is able to correctly predict the, lap the later phrasing. And letter D, a sentence that appears initially to have meaning but that is, in fact, grammatically nonsensical. Again, a garden path sentence can be described as A, a sentence with a structure that leads to initial misinterpretation and subsequent reanalysis. B, a sentence that is ambiguously worded so as to elicit an understanding of the reader's psychological characteristics. C, a sentence that is structured so that the reader, having only read the beginning, is able to correctly predict the later phrasing. D, a sentence that appears initially to have meaning, but that is, in fact, grammatically nonsensical. The correct answer is letter A. A garden path sentence can be described as a sentence with a structure that leads to initial misinterpretation and subsequent reanalysis. Now, the question is, what is a garden path sentence? A garden path sentence is a sentence with a structure that leads to initial misinterpretation and subsequent reanalysis. It is a confusing sentence that leads to misinterpretation, although it is grammatically correct. For you to understand it fully well, you need to analyze it. You have to you have to analyze and you have to reanalyze. The problem with us is when we read sentences, paragraphs, articles, we usually judge as we go along based on what we have read. We do not wait until we have read everything. That is the problem. If we judge right away. So this is the problem if presented to us is a garden path sentence. Because it requires us to suspend our judgment until we have read the entire sentence, the entire text. So for you to understand it fully well, you need to analyze it. You have to analyze and you, you have to reanalyze. For us not to be confused, let us not judge the sentence before we have read everything. Let's analyze. Initially, okay, here, wait. Is some more information about a garden path sentence. A garden path sentence is a sentence with an ambiguous part that leads to the reader to initially assume a certain interpretation for the sentence until they reach a point where the ambiguity is resolved and this initial interpretation is shown to be wrong. Essentially, when you read a garden path sentence, you encounter an ambiguous part that has multiple possible interpretations, so uh, multiple meanings, one of which is significantly more likely to be true than the others, which causes you to select that interpretation for the information that you have read so far. However, as you continue reading, you suddenly realize that this initial interpretation is not valid since it would cause the sentence to be ungrammatical. This forces you to reprocess, to reanalyze the sentence. You go back in order to identify its correct interpretation. So we have an example here. The sentence is, the horse raced past the barn fell. Your main sentence is the horse fell. And we have here a relative gloss. Now we have inserted here 
a relative clause. And what is that relative clause? Which was raised past the barn. That is your relative clause. So we will analyze. So the main sentence is the horse fell. The relative clause is which was raised past the barn. Your new sentence is the horse which was raised past in the barn fell. Or the horse raised past in the barn fell. So this is an example of a garden path sentence and its correct interpretation. Question number 11, uh, number 12. His blank basketball skills attracted scouts from major colleges. A. Nassen. B. Abstemious. C. Tendentious. B. Strident. A. His nascent basketball skills attracted scouts from major colleges. B. His abstemious basketball skills attracted scouts from major colleges. C. His tendentious basketball skills attracted scouts from major colleges. B. His strident basketball skills attracted scouts from major colleges. So which of these choices makes sense? Correct answer is letter A. His nascent basketball skills attracted scouts from major colleges. Nascent here means starting to develop. In other words, his basketball skills were just starting to develop. It's not yet fully developed. He is a budding, or he was a budding basketball player, if that makes sense. Okay? His nascent basketball skills attracted scouts from major colleges. Next, number 13. Oh, Nassen, coming into existence or starting to develop. The country's nascent democracy. In other words, the country's democracy is just starting to develop. It's not an old democracy. There are nascent industries. Okay, number 13. Do we ever blank the pressure? A, get into pressure. B, wrap into pressure. C, give in to pressure. B, go in to pressure. What is the correct answer? This is a, a question about phrasal verbs. Do we ever A, get into pressure? B, wrap into pressure. C, give in to pressure. B, Go in to pressure. The correct answer is letter C, give in to pressure. Do we ever give in to pressure? To give in is to stop fighting, to yield, to surrender. You, know? you allow pressure to control you. you. You give in to pressure. To yield, to surrender. To give in is to finally agree to what someone wants after refusing for a period of time. Again, to give in is to finally agree to what someone wants after refusing for a period of time. Example, he nagged me so much for a new bike that eventually I gave in. Okay, probably the father gave in to what the son had been asking him to buy, and that is a new buy, right? Another example, keep asking, and eventually she will give in. So to give in. Next, number 14. One characteristic of ESP is an attention to A, theory, B, practice. C, both theory and practice, both A and B. B, neither theory nor practice. It's neither A nor B. Again, 
one characteristic of ESP is an, that's, again, English for specific purposes. One characteristic of ESP is an attention to A, theory, B, practice, C, both A and B, both theory and practice, D, neither A nor B. Correct answer is letter C, both theory and practice. One characteristic of ESP is an attention to both theory and practice. So ESP gives attention to both theory and practice. Theory, it is a concept. It's on paper. It is a proposed explanation of things. That is a theory. Practice, it is the actual observation, operation, or experiment. Practice is the real thing. You know? When you go out to the outside world, it's practice. What you learn in school, that's theory. Practice is applied theory. Number 15. Mozart, blank from 1756 to 1791. A, lived from 1756 to 1791. B, lives from 1756 to 1791. C, has lived from 1756 to 1791. B, had lived from 1756 to 1791. What is the correct answer? Correct answer is... Mozart is already dead, right? Right? So the correct answer is simple past tense. I did. So Mozart lived, letter A, from 1756 to 1791. Lived, right? We need a simple present tense here. Uh, we, we need a simple past tense, rather. Simple past tense here. Lived, I did, of the verb, which is I lived, right? Mozart lived and died many years ago, right? So he is, a, or he was a thing of the past. So simple past tense, I lived. I did, I lived, I danced, I planted. Mozart lived. Number, so wait, number 15 still, simple past used for finished actions or states. Usually there is a time element here. For example, I studied my lesson last night. So it's a finished thing. When did you study your lesson? Last night. I saw and yesterday. So saw, simple past. When did you see and yesterday? Number 16. When does remedial work begin? A, after the first few minutes of the very first lesson. B, before the lesson. C, either A or B. B, neither A nor B. Again, when does remedial work begin? A, after the first few minutes of the very first lesson. B, before the lesson. C, either A or B. D, neither A nor B. The correct answer is letter C, either A or B. So when does remedial work begin? Either after the first few minutes of the very first lesson or before the lesson. Before the lesson for those who have been exposed earlier, right? For those who have been exposed to the, um, to the language earlier, right? Why after the very first few minutes of the very first lesson? By then, the teacher can already sense something about the skill, the, the ability of the child, especially those who are lacking, especially those who are wanting, right? Especially those who are struggling. Or even before the lesson, especially in ESL countries, where the students are exposed early on to English. Next, okay, here. 
when according to again let's go back to professor arthur h king of the brigham young university in utah in the united states when does remedial work begin probably he said after the first few minutes of the very first lesson possibly before that as well if as in second language countries or esl countries there has been preschool exposure question number 17 lighthouses are usually situated in this is a question on vocabulary lighthouses are usually situated in a discrepancies b promontories c pylons d emporiums again lighthouses are usually situated in a discrepancies b promontories c pylons d emporiums correct answer is letter b promontories lighthouses are usually situated in promontories what are promontories what is a promontory a promontory a promontory is a long narrow piece of land which sticks out into the sea so we have example sentences here it was such a jolly little lighthouse white and standing at the very end of a promontory another example the plane crashed just off a promontory called lover's point another example yet another fortress stands on a promontory only half a mile away so promontory so this is an example of a promontory the the one pointed by pointed to by the arrow that one is a promontory a piece of land that juts out into the sea number 18 no one chomsky suggested which of the following a there is no fundamental ability for language when a child is born and it is acquired through subsequent exposure to speech. B, children acquire language in different ways and at different rates depending on the culture into which they are born. C, there is an innate human ability to acquire language. And letter D, children learn language as a product of positive reinforcement. We already have an answer here. Okay, again. No one Chomsky suggested which of the following. Let us see, there is an innate human ability to acquire language. So language acquisition is easy for humans because according to Chomsky, there is an innate human ability to acquire language. No one Chomsky, of course, we know him. We love Chomsky is the father of linguistics, the innateness theory, the innateness theory of language, the innateness hypothesis. Knowledge of language is inborn. The innateness hypothesis is the hypothesis presented by Noam Chomsky that children are born with knowledge of the fundamental principles of grammar. Again, the innateness hypothesis is the hypothesis presented by Noam Chomsky that children are born with knowledge of the fundamental principles of grammar. Chomsky asserts with his theory that this inborn knowledge helps children to acquire their native language effortlessly and systematically, despite the complexity of the process. Okay, question number 19, ESP is A, an approach to language teaching, B, a method in language teaching, C, both 
A and B, both an approach and a method in language teaching. C, neither A nor B, not an approach, not a method. Okay, the correct answer is an approach. ESP is an approach to language teaching. ESP is an approach. That is basic. Approach here refers to a way of dealing with language. It is not a process, which is a method. ESP is a way of dealing with language, with language teaching. It is not a process of language teaching. It is an approach. Hutchinson and Waters, our experts on ESP, state that ESP is an approach for language teaching in which all decisions as to content and method are based on the learner's reason for learning. So ESP is an approach to language teaching. And number 20, which of the following uses the passive voice? Passive voice. A, he built this house in 1930. B, 200 people are employed by the company. C, dad baked some cookies yesterday. D, Japan hosted this year's Olympic Games. Again, which of the following uses the passive voice? A, he built this house in 1930. B, 200 people are employed by the company. C, dad baked some cookies yesterday. D, Japan hosted this year's Olympic Games. Correct answer is letter B, 200 people are employed by the company. In a sentence in the passive voice, the subject is not the doer of the action. Not the doer, but the receiver of the action. In letter A, he built. Your subject, he, is the doer of the action built. Letter C, dad baked. Your subject, dad, is the doer of the action baked. And letter D, Japan hosted. The subject, Japan, is the doer of the verb hosted. Okay, number 21. When you organize or perform something for other people's entertainment, such as a play or a concert, you, A, put it on, B, show it up, C, take it off, D, figure it out. Again, when you organize or perform something for other people's entertainment, such as a play or a concert, you, A, you put it on, B, you show it up, C, you take it off, D, you figure it out. Okay, the correct answer is letter A, you put it on. When you organize or perform something for other people's entertainment, such as a play or a concert, you put it on. To put on is to organize an event. So, we have our sentence here. Every year, the city carolers put on a wonderful show in front of City Hall. Okay, number 22. Remedial work in English continues through three stages. What are they? Again, remedial work in English continues through three stages. What are they? A, initial, middle, and final stages. B, primary, secondary, and tertiary stages. C, low, middle, and high stages. D, ordinary, normal, and special stages. Okay, the correct answer is Letter B, primary, secondary, and tertiary stages. Remedial work in English continues through three stages, and these stages are the primary stage, the secondary stage, and the tertiary stage.
So these are the three stages of remediation. And these stages coincide with the different levels of education. We have elementary, we have secondary or high school, and we have tertiary or college. Number 23, it is a rule or principle that is generally considered to be true. Again, it is a rule or principle that is generally considered to be true. A, providence. B, asperity. C, credence. D, action. Again, it is a rule or principle that is generally considered to be true. A, providence. B, asperity. C, credence. B, action. Okay, the correct answer is letter D, action. Action is a rule or principle that is generally considered to be true. And an action is usually accepted as, you know, as something that is true by everybody. An action is a self-evident truth that requires no proof. Example sentence, it is a widely held action that government should not negotiate with terrorists. Another one. Okay, number 24. The linguistic relativity hypothesis proposes that A, some or all of the differences in the way we think and perceive the world arise from differences in the structure of the language we speak. Letter B, some languages are more efficient than others in the representation of the nature of reality. C, understanding and perception of the world are fundamental and not related to the nature of the language we speak. And letter D, it is not possible to translate directly from one language into another and some reinterpretation is always necessary. Again, the linguistic relativity hypothesis proposes that A, some or all of the differences in the way we think and perceive the world arise from differences in the structure of the language we speak. Let it be. Some languages are more efficient than others in the representation of the nature of reality. Let us see. Understanding and perception of the world are fundamental and not related to the nature of the language we speak. Letter D, it is not possible to translate directly from one language into another, and some interpret reinterpretation is always necessary. The correct answer is letter A, the linguistic relativity hypothesis proposes that some or all of the differences in the way we think and perceive the world arise from differences in the structure of the language we speak. So the concept involved here is linguistic relativity. What is the concept of linguistic relativity? It is how language influences our thought. We all know that language and thought interact in many significant ways. The structure of a language influences the way its speakers conceptualize the world. This is the concept of linguistic relativity, how language influences thought. Linguistic relativity, the particular language we speak, 
influences the way we think about reality. Languages are relative. Languages are not the same. Yeah. They vary in their expression of concepts. The way um, Filipinos accept, um, express certain concepts is different from the way the Japanese people express the same concept in their own native language. So this is the concept of linguistic relativity. Languages are relative. They vary in their expression of concepts. So the linguistic relativity hypothesis proposes that some or all the differences in the way we think and perceive the world arise from differences in the structure of the language we speak. Now let's go to number 25. If his dogs do not blank our lawn, I am going to call the dog catcher. A, track down. B, stay off. C, hold up. D, count on. Again, if his dogs do not a, track down our lawn. B, stay off our lawn. C, hold up our lawn. D, count on our lawn. I am going to call the dog catcher. The correct answer is stay off. If his dogs do not stay off our lawn, I am going to call the dog catcher. To stay off is to avoid. So we say, let's stay off the subject of politics. No. Let's not talk about politics. Let's refrain from talking for, you know, about politics. To stay off is to avoid. So if his dogs do not stay off our lawn, I am going to call the dog catcher. To stay off is not to go, is to not go on something. So we say, please stay off the grass. Number 26. What is the structure of the present perfect tense? A, B plus verb ing. So mm, B plus verb ing. So I am doing something. B has or have plus the past participle, okay, or has or have plus PP. So I have done something. C had plus past participle. I had done something. B will plus base form of the verb. I will do something. Again, what is the structure of the present perfect tense? A, B plus verb IMG. I am doing something. B has or have plus the past participle has or have plus pp, I have done something. Letter C, had plus past participle, I had done something. Or letter D, will plus base form of the verb, I will do something. The correct answer is has or have plus the past participle. I have done something, she has done something. That is the structure of the present perfect tense. The present, per the present perfect tense, I have done something. I have watered the plants. I have studied my lessons. In other words, in the present perfect tense, the action happened or started to happen. Uh, the action, uh, when the, uh, rather when the action happened or when the action started to happen is not important. It started to happen or it happened at an indefinite period of time or indefinite period in the past. 
that is the present perfect tense. When you say, I have studied my lesson, it's done, but the time is not important. It has its effect now. Its effect now is that I am confident to take the test. So I have studied my lesson. The present perfect tense refers to an action or state that either occurred at an indefinite time in the past, for example, we have talked before, or began in the past and continued to the present time. In example, he has grown impatient over the last hour. So what is the structure of the present perfect tense again? It's be, has, or have, plus pp, past participle. Question number 27. The lawyer blanked his own witness and lost the case. A, the lawyer incarcerated his own witness and lost the case. B, the lawyer barred his own witness and lost the case. C, the lawyer impeached his own witness and lost the case. Letter D, the lawyer indicted his own witness and lost the case. The correct answer is letter C, the lawyer impeached his own witness and lost the case. To impeach is to question the truthfulness of someone's claim. In other words, the lawyer here questioned the credibility of his own witness. Thus, he lost his case. Well, you, you impeach your witness. The lawyer impeached his witness. So he questioned the truthfulness of the claim of the witness, of his own witness. Okay, number 28. ESP targets the blank of learners. A, the current needs of learners. B, the future needs of learners. C, both A and B. Letter D, neither A nor B. So there is already an answer here. The ESP or English for specific purposes targets both the current needs and the future needs of learners. The needs, of, the needs of the learners now as students and the needs of the learners in the future, you know, in their field of work. So, for example, you know, the needs of the learners now, we term that as, well, English for academic purposes. And the needs of the learners in the future, in their field of work, English for pro professional purposes. It's EAP, English for academic purposes, and English for pro professional purposes. So we have business English. We have English for doctors, English for lawyers, English for engineers, English for nurses. So ESP targets both the current needs and the future needs of learners. <clears throat> Number 29, why do I always blank losers? A, eh? why do I always fall off losers? B, why do I always fall in losers? C, why do I always fall over losers? Letter D, why do I always fall for Losers. What is the correct answer? Again, this is a question about phrasal verbs. Correct answer is fall for. Why do I always fall for losers? 
To fall for is to be tricked into believing something that is not true. Again, to fall for, so for, your, your main verb is fall and your particle, your preposition is for. To fall for is to be tricked into believing something that is not true. Example, he told me that he owned a mansion in Spain and I fell for it. I believed him. But the truth is, he did not own any mansion in Spain. So I fell for it. Another example, on number 30. I am so tired, I blank for a week. A, I, I can sleep for a week. B, I could sleep for a week, C, both A and B, and letter D, neither A nor B. Again, I am so tired, A, I can sleep for a week, letter B, I could sleep for a week, letter C, both A and B, letter D, neither A nor B. What is the correct answer? The correct answer is letter B, could sleep. I'm so tired, I could sleep for a week. Why could and why not can? Why, why is can sleep wrong? Could, well, I could sleep for a week. We use could to take the talk about, it's talk about, sorry. There's, um, there's an error here. We use could to talk about things that are almost impossible to happen. Do you think you could sleep for a week, right? So we use, we use this only for effect, right? We use could to talk about things that are almost impossible to happen. This is only used for effect. Of course, it's almost impossible, right? You only want to show how tired you are. You only want to show that you are really tired. So you said, I could sleep for a week. I'm so tired, I could eat a horse. This is another example. Of course, you cannot eat the whole horse, right? This is only used for effect. This is some kind of an exaggeration, right? Hyperbole, a figure of speech. 200 Okay, number 31. According to the simple view of reading by Hoover and Goff, 1990, what are the two dissociable components that must be mastered to acquire literacy? Again, according to the simple view of reading by Hoover and Goff, 1990, what are the two dissociable components that must be mastered to acquire literacy? A, for the logical awareness and fluency. B, sight, vocabulary, and pattern recognition. C, decoding and language comprehension. D, prosody and phonological comprehension. Correct answer is letter C, decoding and language comprehension. According to the simple view of reading by Hoover and Goff, 1990, the two dissociable components that must be mastered to acquire literacy are decoding and language comprehension. The simple view of reading is a theory that attempts to define the skills that contribute to early reading comprehension. According to the original theory, an individual's reading comprehension is the product of her decoding or his decoding skill and language comprehension. That's according to Goff and Tonmer. 1986. What is decoding? Decoding is the process of translating print 
into speech by rapidly matching a letter or combination of letters, graphemes, their sounds, phonemes, and recognizing the patterns that make syllables and words. That's decoding. There is an area in the brain that deals with language processing and does this automatically. That's the simple view of reading. Next, number 32. To blank is to attract someone. A, to beguile. B, to imbibe. C, to resuscitate. B, to conjure. Conjure. Again, to blank is to attract someone. A, to beguile. B, to imbibe. C, to resuscitate. D, to conjure. The correct answer is beguile. To beguile is to attract someone. To beguile is to charm, attract, or interest, sometimes in order to deceive. Example, she was beguiled by his smooth talk. Again, she was beguiled by his smooth talk. So beguile here has a negative connotation. Your intention is to deceive. You, know, you want to charm someone. You want to attract someone because you want to deceive him or her. That's beguile, to beguile. Number 33. Remedial education is also known as A. Inclusive education. B. Intercultural education. C. Developmental education. B. Informal education. Again, remedial education is also known as A. Inclusive education. B, intercultural education. C, developmental education. B, informal education. The correct answer is letter C, developmental education. Remedial education is also known as developmental education. Developmental education or remedial education includes instruction, coursework, tutoring, personal counseling, career counseling, academic advisement, and others. Developmental education is a comprehensive research-based framework. Developmental education empowers underprepared learners. That's why remedial, right? Remedial education empowers underprepared learners to achieve intellectual, social, and emotional growth. Number 34. Sarah filed for divorce after she had caught George A. cheating her, B. cheating with her, C. cheating on her, letter D. cheating in her. Again, Sarah filed for divorce after she had caught George A. cheating her, B. cheating with her, C. cheating on her, D. cheating in her. The correct answer is letter C, cheating on her. The phrasal verb is cheat on, to cheat on. Sarah filed, her, filed for divorce after she had caught George cheating on her. If you cheat on your husband, wife, or usual sexual partner, you secretly have a sexual 
relationship with someone else. Again, if you cheat on your husband, wife, or usual sexual partner, you secretly have a sexual relationship with someone else to cheat on. Not just cheat, but cheat on. Example, she found out that he had been cheating on her. She found out that he had been cheating on her. To cheat on. Number 35. The effect of poor language instruction is A. Cumulative B. Sudden C. Instantaneous be abrupt. Again, the effect of poor language instruction is A, cumulative, B, sudden, C, instantaneous, B, abrupt. The correct answer is cumulative. The effect of poor language instruction is cumulative. What do we mean by this? There is a cumulative effect in language learning loss because of poor language instruction. When you say cumulative, it means the bad effects pile up through time. The negative impact increases as time progresses. That's the meaning of cumulative effect of poor language instruction. The, the effect of poor language instruction is cumulative. Number 36. We use the subjunctive after the following verbs, except one, which is it? A, suggest. B, propose. C, recommend. D, do. Again, we use the subjunctive. After the following verbs, except one, which is it? A, suggest, B, propose, C, recommend, D, do. The correct answer is do. We use the subjunctive after all these verbs, suggest, propose, recommend, except the verb do. The English subjunctive is a special, relatively rare verb form that expresses something desired or imagined. Again, the English subjunctive is a special, relatively rare verb form that expresses something desired or imagined. It's the subjunctive form of the verb. We use the subjunctive mainly when talking about events that are not certain to happen. For example, we use the subjunctive when talking about events that somebody wants to happen, somebody anticipates will happen, and somebody imagines happening. The form of the base subjunctive is also the base form. When you say base form of the verb, no S, no ED, no EN, no ING. So the base form, for example, is plant. Not planting, not plants, not planted. Just plant. Do is the base form. Not does, not did, not doing. So the form of the base subjunctive is also the base form. It does not change. For example, here, the doctor suggested that he take his vitamins every day. So take. Even though the verb here is in the past tense, so suggested, but it remains the, the, the verb take remains in the base form. Take, not took, right? We don't say the doctor suggested that he took his vitamins every day. Again, the, the, the base, the form of the base subjunctive does not change, whether in the present 
or in the past, whether it's singular or plural. He, we don't say takes. No? Because the rule says, the usual rule says, if it's he, the verb should have, if the subject is he or she or it, no? singular subject, the verb should have s. He takes, she takes, it takes. But in this case, it remains in the base form. It does not change. So the doctor suggested that he take his vitamins every day. If a politician is disliked, he or she is likely to be burned in. A, effigy. B, temerity. C, naivety. D, prodigy. Again, if a politician is disliked, he or she is likely to be burned in. The correct answer is effigy. Effigy. What is an effigy? It is a statue of a famous person. A roughly made, usually ugly model of someone you dislike. A threat to burn the president in effigy. So this, the, the effigy of President Aquino, and another one is the effigy of President Duterte. Number 38. It refers to the needs of learners in a school, university, or other setting where the primary goal is learning. Again, it refers to the needs of learners in a school, university, or other setting where the primary goal is learning. A, occupational needs. B, academic needs. C, motivational needs. D, professional needs. Correct answer is academic needs. It refers to the needs of learners in a school, university, or other setting where the primary goal is learning, academic needs. Learning, academic. Learning needs, academic needs. Academic needs include feeling important and secure in the learning environment, understanding learning goals, having time to integrate learning, understanding the learning process, and receiving feedback. Number 39. Whose mother bathed him in the river Styx as an infant while holding him by the heel? A. Ajax. B. Odysseus. C. Achilles. D. Diomedes. Again, whose mother bathed him in the river Styx as an infant while holding him by the heel? A. Ajax. B. Odysseus. C. Achilles. D. Diomedes. Correct answer is letter C. Achilles. So the mother of Achilles bathed him in the river Styx as an infant while holding him by the heel. So Achilles was invulnerable in all of his body except for one heel. Because when his mother Tethys dipped him in the river Styx as an infant, She held him by one of his heels. According to these legends, the term Achilles heel has come to mean a point of weakness, especially in someone or something 
with an otherwise strong constitution. Your, it's your weakest point. Your Achilles heel is your weakest point. Mathematics is my Achilles heel. Number 40. In which phase of reading and spelling acquisition are children likely to decode only the first few letters of a word and guess the remainder? Again, in which phase of reading and spelling acquisition are children likely to decode only the first few letters of a word and guess the remainder? A, the pre-alphabetic phase. B, the consolidated alphabetic phase. C, the full alphabetic phase. D, the partial alphabetic phase. Again, A, the pre-alphabetic phase. B, the consolidated Alphabetic phase. Now we see the full alphabetic phase. D, the partial alphabetic phase. The correct answer is letter D, the partial alphabetic phase. In which phase of reading and spelling acquisition are children likely to decode only the first few letters of a word and guess the remainder? The partial alphabetic phase. So these are the phases of reading. Some say there are four, others say there are five. So these are the pre-alphabetic phase, the partial alphabetic phase, the full alphabetic phase, the consolidated alphabetic phase, and the automatic alphabetic phase. So a person in the partial alphabetic phase will identify the names and major sounds of most consonants. He or she is increasingly likely to use some of these letter sound associations as decoding and spelling cues. So the child only reads the first few letters of a particular word, and then he or she just guesses the rest. It means the child is in the partial alphabetic phase. She or he or he or she is decreasingly likely to use non-alphabetic context cues. Okay, number 41. Let's go for a walk. Blank. A, don't we? B, will we? C, won't we? D, shall we? Again, let's go for a walk. A, don't we? B, will we? C, want we? D, shall we? Correct answer is letter D, shall we? Let's go for a walk. Shall we? This involves a tag question or a question tag. The rule is positive statement, negative tag question. For example, it's raining, isn't it? It's raining is positive, so the, the tag question should be in the negative, isn't it? Negative statement plus positive tag question. She doesn't like apples, does she? But there are irregular tag questions. And one of these irregular tag questions is the structure let us or let's, whose automatic tag question is shall we? Let's dance, shall we? Let's eat, shall we? Let's go, shall we? So let's go for a walk, 
Shall we? Tag questions. You speak English, don't you? So you speak is in the positive. So the tag question should be in the negative. Don't you? Let's reverse. You don't speak English, do you? So you don't speak English is negative. So the tag question should be in the positive. Do you? You don't speak English, do you? So a tag question is a special construction in English. It is a statement followed by a mini question. We use tag questions to ask for confirmation. They mean something like, is that right? It's raining, isn't it? So, is that right? Or do you agree? They are very common in English. So tag questions or question tags. So the basic structure of a tag question, as I have already mentioned, is positive statement, negative tag. Snow is white, isn't it? Negative statement, positive tag. You don't like me, do you? Notice that the tag repeats the auxiliary verb or main verb when B from the statement and changes it to negative or positive. So this is the structure of a question tag or a tag question. Now let's go to number 42. Authors sometimes use blank to sum up their books. A, bibliographies. B, epilogues. C, blurbs. B, captions. Again, authors sometimes use blank to sum up their books. A, bibliographies. B, epilogues. C, blurbs. D, captions. The correct answer is epilogues. Authors sometimes use epilogues to sum up their books. What is an epilogue? An epilogue is a speech or piece of text that is added to the end of a play or book, often giving a short statement about what happens to the characters after the play or book finishes. Again, an epilogue is a speech or piece of text that is added to the end of a play or book often giving a short statement about what happens to the characters after the play or book finishes. So it is put towards the end of a book or play. It is a supplementary element in a literary work. In a dramatic work, the epilogue is a speech, often in verse, addressed to the audience by one or more of the actors at the end of a play. Number 43. When you make preparations for something in the future, you A. Plan it. B. Plan for it. C. Plan with it. B. Plan on it. Again, when you make preparations for something in the future, you A, plan it, B, plan for it, C, plan with it, B, plan on it. The correct answer is letter B, plan for it. When you make preparations for something in the future, you plan for it. To plan for something is to make necessary arrangements or preparations for something before it happens. For example, it just feels like they didn't plan for it, okay? To plan for. It just feels like they didn't plan for this wedding very carefully, you know. So plan for. Another example, we have been planning for, our, for a trip across Europe for months now. We've been planning for a trip across Europe.
four months now. So to plan for is to make preparations for something in the future. Number 44. Remedial English is of particular importance where English is A, a skill to be learned in English periods, B, a means of teaching other subjects, C, considered an international language, D, a language that must be learned to gain prestige. Again, remedial English is of particular importance where English is A, a skill to be learned in English periods. B, a means of teaching other subjects. C, considered an international language. D, a language that must be learned to gain prestige. The correct answer is letter B, a means of teaching other subjects. Remedial English is of particular importance where English is a means of teaching other subjects. The role of English here, in this case, is a tool subject, a means of teaching other subjects. Well, what is a tool subject? It is a subject when mastered, equips students with a skill useful in studying other subjects. So English as a, English as a tool subject serves as a tool in studying physics, for example, geometry, the social sciences. Grammar is a tool subject for English composition. So remedial English is of particular importance where English is a means of teaching other subjects. Number 45, one arts integrated teaching strategy that drama teaching artists use to help students make mental images is blank. It is a theatrical technique in which actors freeze in poses that create a picture of one important moment in the play. A, mimicry. B, impersonation. C, improvisation. B, Tableau. Again, one arts integrated teaching strategy that drama teaching artists use to help students make mental images is black. It is the theatrical technique in which actors freeze in poses that create a picture of one important moment in the play. A, mimicry. B, impersonation. C, improvisation. D, tableau. Correct answer is letter D, tableau. One arts integrated teaching strategy that drama teaching artists use to help students make mental images is tableau. It is the theatrical technique in which actors freeze in poses that create a picture of one important moment in the play. It's like Paint me a picture game in the classroom. Like this one. Sometimes in the theater or in the theater, the curtain rises and all the actors on stage are frozen in poses that create a compelling stage picture. Like this one. Then on cue the picture, the tableau comes to life with movement and sound. Okay, number 46. Do you sometimes blank in class? A, come off. B, run into. C, doze off. B, fill up to. Again, do you sometimes A, come off in class? B, run into in class. C, doze off in class. B, fill up to in class. The correct answer is 
doze off. Do you sometimes doze off in class? To doze off is to fall asleep for a short period of time. To doze off is to fall asleep for a short period of time. Example, a few students dozed off during the class. A few students dozed off during the class. Another example, the office was so hot, I almost dozed off at my desk. The office was so hot, I almost dozed off at my desk. So doze off, to doze off is to fall asleep for a short period of time. There, the, the woman here is dozing off in class or in a meeting. Number 47. It is considered to be the most influential branch of ESP or English for specific purposes. A, English for academic purposes. B, English for professional purposes. C, both A and B. D, neither A nor B. Again, it is considered to be the most influential branch of ESP or English for specific purposes. A, English for academic purposes. B, English for professional purposes. C, both A and B. D, neither A nor B. The correct answer is letter A, English for academic purposes. The most influential branch of ESP is English for academic purposes or EAP or simply academic English. EAP or academic English is one of the subjects in the senior high school in the K-12 curriculum. I teach this subject at the University of San Agustin Senior High School. Why senior high school? Why is the subject offered in the senior high? Because it prepares students for college. English for academic purposes. English for academic purposes. What is academic English? EAP is concerned with those communication skills in English which are required for study purposes in formal education systems. That's the definition given by the ETIC 1975. English for academic purposes, or EAP, commonly known as academic English, entails training students, usually in a higher education setting, to use language appropriately for study. It is one of the most common forms of English for specific purposes, or ESP. Number 48. Developmental dyslexia is best described as A, a difficulty with reading and writing, which is the result of a lack of access to education. B, a syndrome with a complex neurological basis which affects a range of different areas of cognition. See a problem that mainly affects a person's ability to spell, to spell words correctly. And letter D, a symptom of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. Again, developmental dyslexia is best described as A, a difficulty with reading and writing, which is the result of a lack of access to education, B, a syndrome with a complex neurological basis, which affects a range of different areas of cognition. Let us see a problem that mainly affects a person's ability to spell words correctly. And letter D, a symptom of attention deficit, 
hyperactivity disorder or ADHD? Right answer is letter D. Developmental dyslexia is best described as a symptom of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Dyslexia is a brain-based specific learning disability or LD, learning disability. It affects a person's language ability, making it difficult to learn to read, spell, decode, and recognize words. As a result, reading comprehension, vocabulary, and general knowledge is reduced compared to other children the same age who do not have dyslexia. dyslexia. Remember, dyslexia is not a reflection of intelligence. Most people with dyslexia have normal or even above average intelligence or IQ. ADHD and dyslexia are known to frequently coexist together. Dr. Russell Bartley explains in his book, Taking Charge of ADHD, the Complete Authoritative Guide for Parents, that children with ADHD are more likely to have a learning disability than children who do not have ADHD. The National Center for Learning Disabilities states that dyslexia is the most prevalent LD or learning disability. So developmental dyslexia is best described as a symptom of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Dyslexia is dyslexia and developmental dyslexia are the same conditions. Usually, when someone says dyslexia, he is referring to developmental dyslexia, a kind of dyslexia that is inherited because we have two kinds of dyslexia. Um, developmental dyslexia and the other one is acquired dyslexia. Number 49, the gap between syllabus and achievement is greatest at the point when the student leaves A, preschool for primary education, B, elementary for secondary education, C, secondary for tertiary education, D, tertiary for postgraduate education. Again, the gap between syllabus and achievement is greatest at the point when the student leaves A, preschool for primary education, B, elementary for secondary education, C, secondary for tertiary education, the tertiary for postgraduate education. Correct answer is letter C, secondary for tertiary education. The gap between syllabus and achievement is greatest at the point when the student leaves secondary for tertiary education. When a student moves from high school to college, he or she will be affected severely if what he or she has learned is not enough. We call this achievement gap. In other words, we can tell, the teacher can tell, if the student is not ready for college. The student has not achieved what he or she should have achieved based on the curriculum, same basic education curriculum or syllabus. This is brought about by a lot of factors, several factors, such as 
the rigor of the curriculum, the experience, quality, and commitment by the teachers, etc. Number 50. Which of the following uses a verb in the simple present tense? A. Are you enjoying the party? B. I am going to bed now. C. Tom has lost his key. The nurses take care of patients in hospitals. Again, which of the following uses a verb in the simple present tense? Simple present tense. A, are you enjoying the party? B, I'm going to bed now. C, Tom has lost his key. D, nurses take care of patients in hospitals. The correct answer is letter D. Nurses take care of patients in hospitals. So which of the following uses a verb in the simple present tense? Another D, nurses take care of patients in hospitals. As I have explained earlier, the form of the simple present tense is I do, right? Nurses take care of patients. Letter A, are you enjoying the party? It's present continuous or present progressive tense. Um, let it be, I'm going to bed now. That's present progressive or present continuous. It has a future meaning. And let us see, Tom has lost his key. That's has plus lost, um, past participle. Has plus PP, that's present perfect tense. Again, letter A is present continuous or progressive. Larry B, and going to bed now, that is present progressive or present continuous, having a future meaning. And letter C, Tom has lost his E, it's present perfect tense. So the correct answer is letter D, nurses take care of patients in hospitals. The simple present tense is used to describe habits. The things that you do regularly and changing situations, general truths, and fixed arrangements. When you see general truths, scientific truths, for example, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. The earth revolves around the sun. These are general truths and fixed arrangements. The boss... Uh, the movie opens at 9 o'clock. That is a fixed arrangement. Again, the simple present tense is used to describe habits, unchanging situations, general truths, and fixed arrangements. The form is I do, you do, we do, they do, he does, she does, and it does. Example, the sun rises in the east. So some more examples of sentences having uh, sentences in the present tense. My son lives in London. I do form. She plays basketball. He goes to football every day. He loves to play basketball. Does he go to school? It usually rains every day here, so on and so forth. Present, simple present tense. So thank you. Thanks for watching and see you in the next set. Another 50 set. Good day, everyone.